how do you beat being blind? Well, you call a stressed out random gas station clerk, convince her somehow that you're being chased by your psycho ex-boyfriend and have her guide you through a forest using nothing but the front cam of your phone. That's right, let's go. Emily wakes up in a foreign place, hearing a male voice welcoming her back. We see how she tries to make out stuff on the left, and on the right, we see how she actually sees stuff. That's right, Emily, without her glasses, is practically blind. A few moments pass, and the male voice gently drops her glasses back onto her nose, and boom, let her be light again. As her vision returns, she recognizes her ex-boyfriend Charlie, the guy she dumped not too long ago. Apparently, she broke up with him days after his father had taken him off the board of the family business, implying that he is an entitled man-child who had been getting his life served by rich daddy and can't deal with adversity like normal adult people. While he rambles on, portraying himself as the victim, of course, we see our main character trying to get rid of the zip ties restraining her hands. She fails, however, and is now in a close-up with Charlie who holds a giant wooden cooking spoon in his hand, requesting her to taste it. This sauce is not poison or anything, Charlie here just wants some validation. As she reluctantly tastes his meatball sauce, she can't help but spit it right back into his face. Rule number one, don't spit in your kidnapper's face, okay? A trigger by the spit attack, he chokes her until she almost passes out. He stops just in time for her to apologize and say exactly what he wants to hear. She says that she is sorry for leaving him when things were rough and how she wants to make things right by trying it one more time, perhaps even with couples therapy. To our surprise, he replies saying that that's all he wants and almost starts crying, adding that things were so tough for him. He then rests his head on her stomach and asks her if she would sing for him. Tell me you are a man-child without telling me you are a man-child. Now Emily takes a chance, rips out an emergency device, blinds him and has him fall backwards onto a table. While he is momentarily knocked out, she retrieves the hunter's knife, cuts open the restrainers on her feet, but is caught off guard by a body slam before she can free her hands. Rule number two, only go for a confrontation when you have a chance. While she's on her back, she grabs something made from glass and knocks him over in the last second. She double taps four times, making Columbus proud, and rest assured, Charlie, at least for now, is no threat anymore. The problem? Well, during the struggle, her glasses drop to the floor. Being almost blind, she has to feel for them now. now she is able to find her phone, but unfortunately, she steps on her glasses and breaks them in the process. And looking at how blurry her vision is, it's kind of a death sentence, isn't it? Now, while Emily stumbles blindly into the forest, hoping to escape into safety, let us have a look if she had better options available. Now, there were two obvious mistakes she made, spitting in his face and going for a direct confrontation. In fact, it is safe to say that she's only made it out with a lot of luck. The much better strategy would have been to appeal to this idiot's insecurity. The moment she apologized to him, he completely changed his attitude. He even rested his head on her stomach and asked her to sing for him. That's a nutcase right there. But it's also an invitation to just play along until a better time presents itself to go for a strike. Here's what I mean. You generally don't want to attack someone bigger and stronger than you without using a weapon, especially with her hands and feet tied up. Playing along, using his insecurities to our advantage would buy us more time. And more time means a better chance for a sneak attack from behind. As we see Emily stumbling into the forest, we cut to Sam, a hopeless gas station clerk hating her job while being hated by her own boss. You smell like failure. Emotional now Sam here is the archetype of defeatism. Once you believe you are defeated, you will be reminded of it all day every day. Her first reminder today was her boss. The second reminder is that blonde chick from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory who filled wrong gas into her car and now asks for a refund. Even though Sam replies in the best possible way, I'm sorry ma'am, I can't give you a refund for wrongly pumped gas. Since she is defeated, being rational doesn't matter. 
As long as Karen here insists on her point, she gets it. Because Sam believes that everybody is right except her. So after issuing the refund and kindly reminding her customer that it will take about two to three days for the banks to finalize the transaction, her client insults her even more, steals a bunch of items on the counter and flips her off. Right. A shout out to all the gas station people having to deal with people like this. Your pain is acknowledged. But Sam's stay has yet to reach the low point. Only minutes pass after Karen left the store before Sam's phone rings and well, guess who it is? Blind Emily escaping the grip of her psycho ex. But before the two team up, two important things must be mentioned first. One, Charlie regained consciousness and stepped out of the lodge, planning to catch his prey. Two, Emily was somehow able to dial 911 and notify them about the kidnapping. They will work with a carrier and track her location. The only problem? That can take up to an hour. With how Emily sees the world though, this will be hardly fast enough. So, Emily does the only thing she can think of. She asks the cop lady to video call her so that she can guide her through the trees and bushes. But unfortunately, due to regulations, she isn't allowed to do that. Which is the most NPC answer you can get. You know you're dealing with an NPC when arbitrary rules are held higher than human lives. Anyway, on the phone with the cop lady, Emily stumbles, drops her phone, ends the phone call by mistake and shatters the screen. As she can't help but blindly look at her call history and choose a random number to call back, hoping it's the police she just lost contact with. Rule number 3. If you're blind without glasses, have voice command on shortcut. Just in case. Uh, we can see how she presses at the bottom of her screen. Past calls, however, are typically sorted from top to bottom. So if she wanted to call back 911, then the bottom half wouldn't make much sense. Also, the number layout on the call screen is pretty easy to follow. Even if you can only see the rough layout, you should be able to remember where the 9 and the 1s are. Besides, she uses an iPhone. By attempting to turn off an iPhone, a red button appears signaling an emergency call. Yes, she is blind, but she can perceive color, meaning there were multiple ways to connect her back to the police. But was there anything she could have done better since she escaped into the forest? Calling the cops was definitely a good idea, so good in that. But secondly, she should have considered getting rid of the jumper to stay hidden better. Neon purple? It's not a good idea inside a forest, is it? She would also do well to get rid of the cable binders restricting her hands. Any tree bark could be used as makeshift rasps to damage the binders and break out of them. Considering that's all she could do without external help, these actions have pretty significant positive implications. So I would go for them if I was her. On the phone with Sam, Emily requests the same thing she asked the cop before, to video call her and be her eyes as she escapes the chase of her ex. Of course, Sam is either the best or worst candidate to do something like this. For one, she too is in desperate need for validation and being of importance to someone else. On the other hand, she is stressed out, easily distracted and frankly just an emotional mess. After a lengthy back and forth, Sam is convinced, hangs up the phone and calls back in via video call. She guides her through the trees and bushes and everything goes according to plan. Charlie is nowhere to be seen and the two can make good progress together. But guiding Emily through the forest without an idea where she actually is only has one benefit. It allows her to walk through the woods without walking into trees every other moment. But without luck, she won't get anywhere, right? It would be much more beneficial if they found out where she is. Unfortunately, Sam does not have an iPhone. If she did, they could have used FaceTime, could have triggered content sharing on Emily's iPhone, had Sam guide her through her phone's interface, open maps and boom, pinpoint her exact location. With this, the police could have been notified again, a route to somewhere nearby be found and then safely guide Emily there with the help of Sam being her eyes again. Therefore, it would make sense to help Emily for now while trying to find someone with an iPhone and go about the plan I just mentioned. As Emily makes her way through the forest, she arrives at the fallen tree. 
She notices that the restrained hands are starting to become numb and figures that it would be a good timing to get rid of them. Hearing those concerns, Sam does what every How To Beat writer does all the time, asking Google weird questions. Sergey here shows a legit way to get out of zip ties. In fact, we had mentioned this exact technique in a video a few months ago. Emily does just that with a lot of success. She frees her hand successfully but cuts into her wrist and screams in pain. Stupid move. Since she is a medical doctor, she could have predicted a possible injury and the associated pain. She could have picked up a branch and bit on it, or used her neon purple jumper to bite on. This would have helped avoid letting loose a scream that will be heard by the psychopath that's currently chasing you with a hunter's knife. Now the two of them eventually come up with the idea to find a body of water since most bodies of water eventually lead to civilization. Sam researches again and figures out that birds, especially in the evenings, make their way to those places to rejuvenate. Emily remembers hearing a bunch of birdies flying into this direction. The only bad thing? Well, Charlie seems to have finally caught up as well. Before it comes to a showdown, Emily does indeed get to a place where she hears a river flowing. But in order to get there, she must overcome a pretty steep decline with the help of Sam. Now, things don't go as planned though. Emily drops down while Sam is trying to fix a broken slushy machine, tries to remove the broken charger piece inside her phone and tries to safely guide Emily still. On top of dropping her phone again and struggling to find it, Emily hears a car engine approaching. She hides underneath the decline, imitates a bunch of hobbits escaping the grip of a Nazgul, and barely escapes the psycho's grip. But she commits a pretty stupid mistake in just a few moments. As Charlie walks away from the decline, he opens his car doors, puts on blast Emily singing, and vanishes. Now, what does that signify? Anyone? Well, it's a trap, right? She is blind, therefore has good hearing, obviously he wants to lure her over. Now why she would take the bait, or why he would expect his prey to come closer and not, you know, go the opposite direction is a mystery to me. But what's even more astonishing is the fact that Emily indeed takes the bait. Instead of a 180 into the direction of the river, she rushes up the incline and attempts to hijack his car. Uh, being maneuvered through the forest via video call by foot is one thing, but driving? Uh, that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. I mean, the chance that you won't hit a tree is zero. She couldn't even avoid falling down a 10 feet wide decline moving by foot. How does she intend to maneuver trees in a forest while driving off track and being guided by a laggy, probably not even real-time video chat? Well. She climbs up anyway, gets to the car, and figures that the keys are still inside the car. Mere seconds later, Charlie gets back as well and is now directly in front of the vehicle. Now, the girls wait for the right moment and boom! As Emily floors the pedal, she crashes right into her ex, but also in the tree behind him. Inevitable if you ask me. Now, she's lucky she didn't break an arm, or worse, a leg. She didn't even bother using the seatbelt. I mean, if she made it for the river before, she could already be on the other side and way into the forest on that side. In my opinion, she could have beaten this dude right there. Rule number four, don't drive if you're blind. So Emily does the next best thing. She tries to arm herself with a sharp object, walks over to incapacitated Charlie and almost ends it right then and there. But she doesn't, because understandably, she doesn't want to become a murderer. But she doesn't have to, right? How about going for his Achilles? I mean, he won't die that way, right? But he sure as hell won't be chasing after you either anymore. In fact, after going for his Achilles, take his phone. Chances are he got his GPS activated and Sam could read their position through the video screen. Problem solved. But that was not the only thing that she missed. Nope. After leaving the car crash, we spot Charlie waking up and retrieving a huge gun from his trunk. The same trunk Emily just stood by a minute earlier. On top of that, Sam's phone is running out of battery too and she can't charge it. Plus, Karen from before makes a return as well, because that woman forgot her credit card. So while Charlie is closing in on Emily, our girl's call disconnects and Sam is going for her own showdown. 
here is what happens. Sam snatches her sworn enemy's phone away, like a high crime neighborhood kid looking for some quick cash, runs into her cashier corner and barricades herself. As clumsy as Sam is though, you gotta give her props for that. Both of them start to argue until Blondie explodes. She rushes out, giving Sam a chance to retrieve the leaflet with Emily's number on it that she dropped a second earlier, and comes back with a gun. Now, Sam doesn't want to be killed, of course, and hands over the phone she took. At least, that's how it seems. In reality, she exchanged the phone cases and made it look like it's Blondie's phone, even though it isn't. Now, Blondie leaves the store and Sam finally can call back Emily in peace. But Emily, as we see, is in a much worse spot than before. Here's what happened. Charlie caught up with Emily and held her at gunpoint. He spoofed some basic, manipulative, narcissist stuff and had her eventually fall backwards into the ravaging river below. She woke up somewhere further down the stream with her phone miraculously still intact. And now, pretty damaged, is ready to give up. But that's the moment Sam calls back. Now, there is so much going on in the last few minutes of this movie, it's kind of crazy, but I'll do my best to cover it all as best as I can. So, while Emily is lying half dead at the shores of the river, basically having accepted her defeat, Sam, of all people, becomes the most important figure in her life. After prompting Sam to inviting her mom into the call, and after she bawls her eyes out, apologizing profusely to her mother, believing she won't survive this night, Sam turns into a full-blown motivational speaker and starts prepping up Emily as good as she can. Even Em's mom joins in and passes on some motivation and hope. They then spot the light somewhere in the back and assume that that must be a house. Emily rushes over as quickly as she can and indeed arrives at the barn. And where there is a barn, there's usually a farm with people in. Unfortunately, well, Charlie is close too, as Sam spots his flashlight drawing closer in the background. Now, Emily enters the barn and tries to find a good hiding spot preparing for the final showdown. Meanwhile, Sam is surprised by Blondie coming back, but this time with her father or lover, or whoever that is. Either way, both of them are completely crazy. They are heavily armed and try to break into the shop only to be stopped by Sam who can lock the door in the last moment. Now all of this happens while Emily is stuck in the barn herself, not exactly knowing where to go, while Sam is distracted. Everything goes completely out of hand at this point in the movie. It is a complete utter mess in the best possible way. It spikes adrenaline similar to the most intense moments of everything everywhere all at once, making you feel like you're about to have a seizure or stroke. So while Sam is trying to cool her nerves facing the two maniacs and later even her boss that joins them, Emily is stuck with Charlie almost at her tail. Now Sam comes up with a genius plan though and prompts Emily to hide and arm herself with a liquid chemical that she spotted via video call. The goal is to wait for the right moment, jump out and go for the final strike. The challenge? Well, the three maniacs who by now have even called the cops are as loud as they can be. Meaning, the moment Charlie enters the barn, it will immediately attract Charlie's attention and blow up Emily's cover. Therefore, Sam comes up with a final piece, but also riskiest piece, of the plan. She will mute herself and prompt Emily via text message the moment Charlie steps into the right spot. Risky idea, but pretty much the only chance they have left. So as Charlie finally breaks into the barn and Sam mutes herself, he walks right up the stairs, sees the neon purple jacket of Emily and shots at it, only to realize that it was a decoy. Pretty good. Now just then, at the prompt of Sam, she jumps out and sprays the acidic chemical at Charlie and tries to push him over the railing. It's not enough to take him on though and soon Charlie's hands are firmly gripping at Emily's neck. In fact, she almost loses consciousness. And with Sam stuck in her own risky situation, things seem almost lost and hopeless. However, right at that point, Sam remembers the glass shard Emily had picked up before and screams at Emily to use it. So, Em grabs a shard in her pocket, goes for the neck like a real surgeon and finishes off her psycho ex doubling down with a final Spartan kick that has him crash down to the floor. And if that wasn't satisfying enough, we cut to Sam who now surrenders to the screaming cops as proudly as one can be arrested. 
and as she is detained and brought to the car, she can't help but say goodbye in the most satisfying way possible. Beautiful. But what's even more beautiful is the fact that the secret of how Sam accidentally called Emily's phone number at the very beginning is finally revealed. You see, only by her accidentally dialing Emily, the two connected later on and that whole adventure could take place. The reason how Sam called Emily's number though was that she actually tried to reach out to this helpline here, showing how desperate she must have been at that time. She must have misdialed though and instead called Emily somehow. In any way, this led to the story we have just witnessed, which, if we're honest, probably was way better than any helpline. Because of this incident, Sam not only gained a valuable new friend, but she also rediscovered her own worth. And even though there were plenty of options for Emily to beat her psycho ex sooner, if she had, we would have not been treated with this pretty epic ending. And with that said, my friends, thank you for watching, take care and binge another one. Catch you soon.